We are so excited for you to join our Love Driven video series. Be prepared to be impacted and transformed so that you can impact others. Hi, my name is Chad Reyes. I'm excited to be with you for this month's Love Driven video series. And today I have my business partner, John Piccarello, who's our chief, uh, chief leadership officer over at Lions Pride. And we're gonna be talking today about building a love-driven culture. And there's nothing better than building a love-driven culture, especially around this time of the year, because right now we're around Valentine's Day, and uh, we, you know, we, we wanted to dovetail the two, dovetail the season with business. So we're, we're gonna jump in, we're gonna be uh, having a conversation around building love-driven cultures. So John, a lot of the times when you're writing articles, uh, or we're speaking at our Lions Club Masterminds, we're talking about building love-driven cultures. Right. Um, and you know, there are statistics that show that building love-driven cultures are more profitable than not uh, right. building those types of cultures. But what is a love-driven culture for those that are listening? When they say, "Okay, I, I hear the idea, I hear the I hear the word," but but what exactly is that? Can you can you share with them what a love-driven culture is? Sure, well, a love-driven culture where the people are valued above all things. Mm. For any company, the most precious asset for any company is personnel. Without the personnel, you don't have a company. Yeah. So love-driven culture is where every person is valued. It's being a, a more empathic leader, mm -hmm. where, yeah, you're, you're always looking ahead. It's all vision, and, of course, you're looking at the bottom line. It has to be profitable. You don't stay in business. Yeah. But having the, the confidence with the understanding what drives that, well, mm. it's the caliber of your team. So love-driven culture is having an, a work environment where every person is important, every person is valued, uh, no person is better than another one, mm -hmm. you know, having levels, but each person is unique, and some have stronger gifts, stronger yeah. talents, mm -hmm. but it's knowing where they are, where they fit, mm -hmm. and that they are the most valuable in that area. Awesome. And you can rely on them, you count on them. Yeah, so yeah. Everyone is encouraged, accepted, to be themselves and to grow themselves. Mm. You know, a lot of the times we talk about love-driven cultures, but we also talk about fear-driven cultures, right? right? And for those that are listening, um, we really talk about the difference between love and fear, and we, we, we give it an acronym, and it's an acronym we use. We say love-driven cultures are leaving others valuable experience cultures, and fear-driven cultures are uh, cultures that are around false evidence appearing real. Um, John, can you kind of unpack that a little bit more around what a fear-driven culture looks like? Because for those that are listening, I'm sure they're saying, okay, I would love to build a love-driven culture, mm -hmm. but how do I do that? And then what is the difference between other cultures? So can we give them a contrast of what a fear-driven culture looks like? Right. And, then, and then how can we intentionally build a love-driven culture? Okay. The, the fear-driven culture is when you said, using the acronym of false evidence appearing real. And what it is, it's the leader's insecurity. Mm, so yeah. they're insecure. Now, as a leader, if they are what we call a positional leader, mm -hmm. you know, the, the five levels of leadership, it's the entry level of leadership. So it's position. So you are leading and you get the people to follow you simply because of your title and your position. Mm. Now, what happens at that level is because you're staking everything mm on your position yeah. or your title. Now when someone comes in and they're better gifted, better talented or whatever, or even more suited, instead of having the idea that, okay, I'll just bump up, mm. they can replace me and take it here and I'll just step up. Instead of doing that where now you're really adding value. Mm. Well, what you do is you look at them as a threat, not as an asset. You know, it's funny. So um, when Danielle and I were out in Atlanta, uh, and also uh, in North Carolina with John Maxwell, um, he was talking about in his culture how there's only really two options. It's either you're growing and developing leaders, right. and then you're being moved up, or you're not growing and developing leaders, and ultimately then you're being moved out. Right. Um, and, and it kind of just, what you were sharing, just brought me to that, that love-driven cultures is all around developing leaders. Yes. And fear-driven cultures is all about developing positions. That's right. Yeah. So, um, can, can you share maybe a little bit more on what 
I guess the, what, the, what the, the listeners can really glean from building a love-driven culture. So if it's all around building leaders mm-hmm. and, and they're not comfortable or they haven't done that or, or they're not really totally uh, ready to build just the leaders and develop the leaders, right. what can, how can they get started? How can they start building momentum? How can they start starting to build this love-driven culture? Right. The, the first step is you have to build yourself. Mm. Remember we talked about the positional yeah, uh-huh. leader is insecure. So self-awareness, you know, the big talk about EQ. Well, self-awareness is everything. And if you become more self-aware as a leader mm. and you're honest, yeah. and so you'll know your, your strengths, your weaknesses. Now, we don't always know our blind spots. You got, I got to stop you. Go ahead. So you said if you're honest. Yes. So, so if, if you're a leader, and now, now this is the struggle because there'll be people that are listening that may feel like this. If they're struggling to really ascertain where they are, right? How would you recommend though someone who says, "I know that I want to be that leader, but right. how, how can they recognize or how can they bring people from the outside to look in and bring some advice of where they really are as a leader? Right. Is there any any uh, tips that you can give to help identify what type of leader that you are? Sure. The first step, as I said, we'll get to the honesty. Yeah. First, do that. That, that's where self-awareness comes in, that understanding, now this is normal for every person, understanding how we judge ourselves and how we judge others. So we judge ourselves by looking at our intentions mm-hmm. because we know our intentions. Yeah. And so we have a desire to do A, B, and C. And we might think through it, we might even write it out, have a plan and mm-hmm. all this stuff. Now let's say we just never move on it, but we've been carrying this around for months. Well, we're judging ourselves based on that. Now, unfortunately, that gives us a false impression of who we actually are. Because other people don't know what we're thinking. So they're looking at what we're getting done. And they're watching our conduct and how we express ourselves. So they have no idea. So they're looking at us as, well, all right, my greatest, say one to 10, then my greatest a three. But we have these thoughts of what we want to do so we're going to grade ourselves like well, we're a six or mm. we're going to a seven. Yeah. So that's where you have to start. You have to be on the same page of what people see and have the ability to grade yourselves on the outcomes, on your competency, on your accomplishments, because that's what the people see. Yeah. So what, intentions. So what I think I'm hearing is the difference between good intentions mm-hmm. and intentionally good, yes. right? Because good intention says... I would, this is what I want to do, this is what I'd like to do, even you may have them in your, your mind or you may have written them down on a piece right. of paper, but intentionally good is not what I want to do, intentionally good is what I've actually done. That's right. Right? And, and, and that, so that's what you're saying, love-driven cultures is all about it being intentionally good, that's not right. talking about what you really want to do but not get done. That's right. That's right. the old saying, you know, talk is cheap. Yeah. And uh, it's really showing the people. So if, let's just say if I have a team and I'm saying that, all right, I want this team to go to the next level. Now that's great. And speaking to your point about Mm -hmm. having good intentions, I might have that plan. But unless I communicate to them what the next level looks like, what it's going to entail, Mm. and then how I'm going to challenge them to reach their potential by taking that next step to go up one level, then it's the business as usual. So there's gonna be change And uh, it's a a wonderful, wonderfully scary thing at the same time. Because going up the next level, reaching your potential, and taking your team with you Mm -hmm. is change. So that means you're going to get outside your comfort zone, and you're going to step into a new area of potential that you have the skills and you have to know your team. And actually utilizing these skills for the first time at that level, there's going to be some pushback. There'll be some failures. Mm -hmm. So being a leader, uh, being love-driven, where if I'm going to develop leaders, I have to understand that, okay, I need to allow this person to make some mistakes. I need to That's allow hard. them to fail. Oh, it is I mean, very hard. I mean, I've, I've been at this for now 18, 19 years. I don't even know how long, but... That's hard though, especially when profit's on the line, yes. especially when bills, expenses, payroll, everything's on the line, right. to just allow people to fail. Um, but can, I, think, I think we need to um, build upon that because I think sure. that the people that are listening are gonna say, okay, so you just let them fail? And, and I know that's not what you mean. Right. I, I, I think what you're, what you're saying is let them fail, but be there to observe when they fail 
learn from it, and then let them fail forward, right? That's kind of what you're getting exactly. to. Exactly. Can you share a real practical way to do that so that the listeners can say, okay, I can apply that in my business. I can apply that in my relationships. I can apply that in my family. Right. What's a, a, a practical way to allow someone to fail forward? Okay. And that's great you said fail forward. It's, you have to single out somebody, for instance. And remember, we're talking about the context of leadership development. You're developing mm -hmm. leaders. So the first thing you need to do is spot who on your team has the potential. Now, we're taking it for granted that you're already self-adjusted, you're self-aware, yeah. and you're a, you're a love-driven leader, in whatever stage that may be. So the first thing is you're going to look at is, right, who is your most valuable player mm -hmm. on the team? Who comes through? Who do the other people look to? When you're in, when you're in meetings and you might be sharing something and, and you're just around the table, look at the leaders uh, in the room. And then you're going to spot, all right, who's ready to go to the next level? Let's just mm -hmm. say everybody's a level one leader. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, you want to take some to level two. So you want to get them to, you know, they really have buy-in with the people. The first thing you do is just as you're having roundtable discussions, watch the reaction of your team members when each individual on your team speaks. Mm. And you'll see it. Yeah. The ones that hold the attention, the ones that get an affirmative, those are the ones you're going to want to talk to. You know, if you see just maybe a nod, that's it. But you could see the response. Yeah. Then those are influencers. Yeah. And those are the ones you're going to have as team leaders. And that's where you test first. Yeah. So, um, so what you're saying is, is that leadership is not necessarily just about the title. Leadership is about influence. Yes. Right. Because, because what I'm hearing, and I and I know you and I have talked about this, is that most organizations, right, give people titles. Yeah. But really what you're saying is, is that if we're going to grow and we're going to fail forward and we're going to continue to learn, we need to identify people that have influence. Right. And then what we need to do is allow them to actually do something, work in the, in the company, right. do something and not necessarily perform well at it, but then be there as a leader to pick them up and say, listen, I observed what happened. Right. What can we learn from this and let's grow from it, right? right. So that, that's really what a love-driven culture is, at least what, in my understanding, and I, I would think you would agree, is that love-driven cultures allow people to fail. Yes. Don't allow people to stay there. That's right. Right? And they learn from it. And learn from it. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I, I failed, but I'm not going to stay there permanently. I'm going to learn why I failed, right. and then I'm going to apply it. And, and that's part of the leaving others valuable experiences. I, yeah. I, I always talk about that how important it is for people to really understand that everything we do is either a deposit or it's a withdrawal right. yes. out of that relationship. And, you, right. and you've shared that so many times, I think, in articles you've written, uh, th you know, uh, interviews you've had. Right. The relation account. It's the relational account, right? But love-driven cultures deposit more than they withdraw. Yeah. Can you kind of just share that as we come to wrap up what a love-driven culture is? Okay. Um, going back to our leadership analogy, where reverse it, uh, as you said, to your point before, a lot of people are given the position, mm -hmm. and then you have to earn it. You have to try to stay there. But in a love-driven culture, what you're given is an opportunity to express your influence. Mm. Because you're influential, and if I am able to guide you, give you the steps, one, two, three, that the new position requires, I won't tell you that because I'm not going to promise you the position. Mm -hmm. And this way, if you fail, it, it's not as traumatic to the person who's being trained. And what I found over the years is that if I release influence to a person, and I loan them influence by being their biggest cheerleader, I build them up in front of people yeah. in, in, in accordance with their gifts and their talents. And then I give them projects which gives them influence. Yeah. How oh, they sorry. handle that, then what happens is people begin to recognize them and equate them with the position. Mm. Yeah. So they actually have the influence for the position. Mm. They are recognized by their peers for the position long before it's ever conferred on. Yeah. And you know, um, our friend Joe, uh, he shares all the time, he says, before I give a title, mm -hmm. I watch them operate in it. Yes. So I think love-driven cultures, to that point, is cultures that are very aware of the leaders they have in the room. Right. And they're able to, uh, they're able to clearly observe Who's on my team? How are they operating? And then when they recognize that that person's been operating at that level as a love-driven leader, at that point, then, and they've been doing it for a while now, 
Right. He's, Joe said, then at that point is when you give the title. That's right. You don't give the title and then hope for them right. to operate that way. Right. You observe that they're operating that way and then give the title. Is that That's right. right? Does that make sense? That's right. The, the other way would be a lose-lose if they fail. If I give them the title and then they don't carry influence well, and for whatever reason, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's irreparable, but the thing is, once they're there and the title is there, now if they fail, so now you have a problem with credibility. Yeah. So it's, it's easy to do it the other way, you're exactly right. If they're functioning and they're successful, well, the influence is always going to be there, and their competency will demonstrate they've already earned the title, so that's why you give it later. It's acknowledging what they've already been doing. Good stuff. So you've written articles about this on our website at lionsprideleadership.com. So uh, for those of you that were watching this conversation, I, I hope it was encouraging. Uh, there are articles that are on our website, lionsprideleadership.com. You can go on there and you could read more stuff that John and our team has put together on love-driven cultures. Um, but excited that we had this time to spend with you. I uh, hope you were impacted by it. Please feel free to share it with those that you know that can benefit from it. Um, thank you. God bless you. Uh, and wish you all the best in your leadership journey.